Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Kim Ricketts, and I manage, along with Kirsten Wiley, the Microsoft Research Visiting Speaker Series. Today, we welcome Rob Walker to Microsoft Research to discuss with us his thoughts on what marketing means to us today, what works, what doesn't, and most interestingly, why. In our current world of TiVo and YouTube and Craigslist and MySpace, what marketing is and isn't has become murky, or what Rob terms marketing. And he takes us on a visit to this new consumer world, that hazy and mysterious place where sometimes, sometimes magic happens and people embrace a brand or a product in such a way as to make traditional marketing obsolete and irrelevant. Rob dissects that magic a little bit for us today and takes us on a tour through this new world. And is, it's all also collected in his new book, Buying In, and in his regular consumed column, of which I'm an avid reader, in the New York Times Magazine. So please join me in welcoming Rob Walker to Microsoft Research. Thank you. Hello. So let's see if there's a microphone on. Yes? People can hear me? OK. Um, thank you all so much for coming out, especially on uh, a drop dead beautiful day when it would be so much more pleasant to just sit there and <laughs> stare at the sun than to stare at me. Um, so I'm going to talk uh, about I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of why I wrote the book, and then I'm going to read a little bit from it and um, try to, as best I can, draw some conclusions of some interest you know, within the confines of just really having a relatively short amount of time to work with. Um, I have a small favor to ask. This is always a judgment call. In, the, in, in this audience, I'm going to go ahead and make the judgment that I'm going to do it. Um, my uh, wife, some years ago, or about a year ago, introduced me to the work of a photographer called Tim um, Davis, who has a great website, davistim.com. And one of the excellent projects on his website is a project called My Audience. And he takes a picture every time he t talks to a group. He takes a picture of his audience. And I thought that was such a great idea. And the pictures are great. And I was like, oh, how can I steal that? I really like that. And so the way I came up with to steal the idea and also to um, not have to deal with the possibility of asking anyone for permission to use their likeness on uh, my website is that I, um, I ask everyone to just uh, briefly, if you could, just obscure your, your face. <laughs> and this is, boy, I got, it's a tough angle here. All right, yeah, so look at me over here, but obscure your face. Yeah. Everybody has to do it. Please obscure your face. Come on. <laughs> Thank you so much. So is it, you can tell it's a tough crowd when some people are like, I'm not doing it. I'm not going to explain my face. All right. So that's that. Well, um, so a lot of cons uh, people familiar with the consumed column? Some? OK. Um, and with marketing.com, which is a website of mine. Um, OK. So the book is similar in theme to all that stuff. What I write about is consumer culture and consumer behavior. And I've been doing that now for, uh, I guess, close to eight years. And I should mention that I started by writing for Slate, which, uh, or I started on this subject by writing for Slate, which, of course, used to be a Microsoft property. So I used to get checks, Microsoft checks, all the time. And that was really jarring for me the first time I got a check from Microsoft. It really seemed like getting a check from the government or something. Um, <laughs> Uh, but Slate was great to me, and so I've been to this campus a few times on, uh, when we would have retreats. And, um, and uh, in those days, what I was writing was the ad report card column, which still exists. It's written by someone else. Um, and in those days, I was really functioning just essentially as a critic of advertising in the sense of I was just judging it. But the premise of that column was that advertising is part of popular culture. It's part of culture. It's part of American culture and should be just evaluated in that way as opposed to sort of from a trade magazine point of view of um, who got the business and who the agency is and all that kind of stuff. And that general idea has stuck with me throughout uh, all the work I've done since, although I subsequently started moving into doing stories where I was spending time with 
marketers and designers and product makers and all kinds of experts in the process. But always in the writing, I was trying to keep the consumer in mind because it's very easy to get caught up in the one side of the um, equation. Uh, which leads to the subtitle of the book is The Secret Dialogue Between What We Buy and Who We Are. <clears throat> and that's generally my theme. And I figured I made, it would be useful to just define it. And since I defined it so well here in the book, I'm just going to read you two paragraphs. Um, this what this book is about, the secret dialogue between what we buy and who we are and how it's changing. I use the word dialogue because what I'm talking about is not a, a one-way process. It is not simply about the intrinsic elements of, say, uh, the Zune. OK, it doesn't say the Zune in the book. It says, <laughs> says something else. It's not just about what a product is made of or what it's supposed to do, nor is it about a brand image that's invented by experts and foisted on the masses who swallow it whole. Uh, any product or brand that catches on in the marketplace does so because of us, because enough of us decided that it had value or meaning and chose to participate, because of the dialogue between consumer and consumed. And I use the word secret because the way that that dialogue plays out is anything but explicit. It's complex, subtle, and sometimes misleading. And I suggest that it's changing because in the years since I've been writing about this stuff, um, that secret dialogue has, in my view, gotten uh, murkier uh, than ever. So it's no huge insight to say that it's been changing. Everybody knows we've all lived through the past eight years. There's been sort of, in addition to the web, in particular in the advertising world, the, uh, the, 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 just the announcement of TiVo was a huge uh, incident, basically, uh, that this thing was going, this piece of technology was going to give us this power to zap past um, um, ads was seen as a huge and empowering thing and, and certainly a, a marker of some kind of big change. So I got interested in trying to, in thinking about writing a, a book that would be about, well, what is the big picture change, not just the sort of incremental day-to-day day -day thing that I was covering in each little column or, or article that I was writing. Um, so what's the nature of that change? Well, here's, let me give you one point of view on that. It's just a couple of paragraphs, or just one paragraph. Um, here's what it says. <laughs> the dimensions of the latest trends in consumer behavior were outlined in an overview in the Harvard Business Review. This new zeitgeist, the August publication explained, is being fueled by, quote, the efforts of consumers themselves, who have lately become articulate. One of the defining features of this fresh paradigm is the new consumer's demand for information, quotes. They're banding together, becoming, quote, better educated and better organized with a growing familiarity with the mechanics of advertising and the endless range of gimmicky sales tactics. They have suffered from deceptive and stupid advertising long enough, that's a quote, and it is only inevitable that power should shift to them in an economy that has moved from scarcity to abundance. These changes, this article summarized, have tended to make consumers more critical and to enhance their importance. And this was the state of things in 1939, <laughs> which is when that article was written. And that's one of many times over the course of writing about consumers that this observation has been brought out that, oh, they're smarter than they used to be, and they're more wise to the ways of advertising than they used to be, and they have more power than they used to have. Uh, during this particular wave of it, there are other quotations here from Business Week, and this, my favorite one, is from Advertising Age in 1940, which declared that this new consumer is the major problem for business, and that most advertising and merchandising men see this new consumer as, quote, an incomprehensible ogre. <laughs> now, you're not going to catch Advertising Age using language like that anymore, but you will catch them uh, giving you that basic insight as essentially what's supposed to be new and different about today. And um, obviously, I don't think that is new and different. I think that as long as there's been advertising, there's been skepticism about advertising. And as long as there's been skepticism about advertising, there's been ad experts complaining about consumers not going along with the program. So that's not new. Um, so if that's not new, then what is? Well, that's what ultimately I'm writing about in the book. And let me give you just a little bit of additional context, and then I'll read you one section. Um, the way that I view it 
there are essentially, just on a really basic level, I think, four and a half, I like to say, factors, rational factors that guide a purchase decision. And those would be price, quality, convenience, pleasure, and then this half factor, which is consumer ethics, which I'll come back to and talk about more at the end. Um, and that sounds like a pretty good rational framework, those factors. But the problem is what? The problem is that if you really look at the reality of the marketplace, it's pretty hard to make decisions based just on those factors. And as an example, a while ago, Consumer Reports did a rundown of evaluating kitchen stoves and ranges. Pretty mundane object. 53 different choices were available. They evaluated all 53. They found that all 53 were either good, very good, or excellent. So in other words, there's not a lot of differentiation. It's pretty hard to choose if you're just going to go on the basis of price, quality, convenience, and pleasure. I call it in the book the pretty good problem. There's a tremendous amount of pretty good stuff out there. And I think you can replicate that. I mean, you can pick up any issue of Consumer Reports and find whatever they're evaluating that week. There's not a huge amount. There's not a lot of like terrible stuff. It's, most stuff, just, it's pretty good. So how do you make it stand out? It's a problem for both sides of the equation. It's a problem for the consumer. It's hard to choose. It's a problem for the business. How do you stand out? Um, one of the interesting examples in the realm of ranges is the Viking range, um, which you know, has tremendous name recognition and has tremendous brand power. And this is one of the ways that the pretty good problem gets resolved, is through branding. And branding, people sometimes, maybe not this audience, but sometimes when I talk about branding, people think that I just mean like a logo or a slogan or an ad. Branding is the process of attaching an idea to something, a thing, a product. Um, and that idea 100 years ago might have been something as straightforward as quality and consistency, that Pillsbury flour you know that brand name, and you know that it's going to be reliable and trustworthy in a way that the um, unmarked flower in your local uh, 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 market might not be. Well, over time, as the marketplace has become more and more cluttered, the ideas attached to the products have become more and more um, elaborate and aggressive and big. And as an example, I would suggest the Dove campaign uh, for, you know, which takes the form of making a statement about the nature of beauty, which is a pretty big um, idea to attach to a line of, you know, lotions and uh, uh, face creams and whatnot. Um, and that idea can get attached to a product or a thing, not just by marketers, as in the case of the Dove campaign, but also by us. And what's interesting is that we're more willing to attach bigger ideas, in my view, to brands than we used to. And in some ways, the Viking range is actually a small example of that. Because if you're curious, it didn't really fare that well in Consumer Reports' breakdown. It was sort of in the middle, even among high-end ranges. Nevertheless, it has some kind of brand power that some experts have, have suggested that it's about, speaks to a kind of self-expression thing that um, we feel like it expresses a kind of creativity and um, for the home cook that they need a restaurant quality stove, uh, which is an interesting line of thought until you learn the shockingly high percentage of Viking ranges installed in homes that are never used. So something else is going on there. So here's a little passage from the book that people have reacted to, so I like to use it as a good example of what I'm calling marketing. At Alberta Park in northeast Portland, about 100 serious bicyclists, most of them young men, many tattooed and pierced, and at least one wearing striped tights and a floral thrift shop dress, arrived en masse on a Saturday evening. They gathered near a fenced-off hardtop court, and in teams of three began a bike polo tournament. Almost all were bike messengers, about a third of them local. The rest came from Seattle, San Francisco, and elsewhere. And they lived up to the image of couriers as marginal testosterone-charged troublemakers. 
They drank beer, they smoked cigarettes, among other things, and they yelled profane insults at one another. These rowdy bike messengers slugging their beer from 40-ounce bottles and smashing into one another in their bike polo matches did not seem the sort to play any kind of role in the creation of brand meaning. They seemed like a variation of the outlaw archetype, willful outsiders, indifferent to rules and norms, with the creatively reconfigured bikes, uh, with their creatively reconfigured and customized bikes, they were authentic and alive, and as far removed from the rigid world of commercial persuasion as, po as it is possible to be. And they seemed not just indifferent to the culture of branded materialism, but hostile to it. But what appeared to be an unlawful party in the park was in fact part of the West Side Invite, prizes for which were underwritten by a $1,750 contribution from the Pabst Brewing Company. Curiously, there were no banners or signs announcing the beer maker's role in their fun, and no one from Pabst was on site to glad hand the bikers. PBR, as fans call it, was in the midst of a highly unlikely combat, comeback, and the unruly bike messenger subculture had something to do with that. Now, this was in around 2000 three or four when I was uh, on hand for this. And PBR had uh, been in a long sales decline from about 1975 to 2001, year after year after year, sales had gone down. And then in 2002, for reasons that escaped the company, sales rose. Uh, they didn't know what was going on. They rose, the growth started and was most pronounced in, in Portland a city best known in the cosmology of beer as a haven for fancy craft offerings. There, the lowbrow brew had risen to the number five ranked beer in town, the fastest growing of the top 50 domestic beers. In local supermarket sales, it trailed only Coors Light, Budweiser, Bud Light, and Corona. And at first, as I say, even the people at Pabst, which had barely advertised for more than 20 years, were at a loss. The trend-explaining industry framed the rise of PBR as part of an alleged retro-chic movement. A subset white trash theory linked PBR to Levi's, whose sales had actually fallen, and trucker hats, the fad that was revealed and snuffed out almost simultaneously when Ashton Kutcher wore one on his MTV show, Punked. <laughs> the job of finding a less ethereal explanation, one that Pabst Brewing Company could actually do something about, fell to Neil Stewart. Stewart was a baby-faced 27-year-old when he joined Pabst as a divisional marketing manager in the summer of 2000. At the time, uh, their marketing amounted to some low-grade car, car racing sponsorships, country music events, and fishing promotions. But a sales rep in Portland had noticed that what he called these alternative people were starting to get into the brand. So Stewart went to Portland to visit bars where PBR was selling. He dropped by the Lutz Tavern near Reed College. Slumming students here used to drink a brand called Blitz, a low-priced, locally brewed brand that went out of business in 1999. That year, the owner of the Lutz Tavern decided to start selling cans of Paps for a dollar as a summer special. And years later, the sale still wasn't over, and PBR was the bar's top seller. Stewart then braved the Ash Street Saloon, a bike messenger hangout downtown. Portland messengers had also favored Blitz, again because it was cheap, and they had switched to PBR too. And the interesting thing about this was that the common theme among all these people who were embracing the brand seemed to be that they were young, smart, and often skeptical types, precisely the kind of people who can't be fooled by marketing and, in fact, tend to detest it. Now, the beer industry spends about a billion dollars a year on uh, marketing. And uh, that's almost entirely image-based marketing, and, uh, which is not surprising because tests have found that even hardcore fans, self-identifying hardcore fans of Budweiser and Miller Genuine Draft, by and large, can't tell them apart in blind taste tests. So PBR didn't have any image. It was just there. And the single key text to Neil Stewart, the past marketer's codification of the meaning that was being um, formed for PBR in the marketplace, the key text for him was, of all things, No Logo, the book by journalist and commentator Naomi Klein. No Logo had presented an argument about branding and marketing overload, bullying and rapacious mindset that this trend represented, and evidence of a grassroots backlash against it, especially among young people. Klein's view was that this would feed a new wave of activists who targeted corporations, and Neil Stewart's view 
was that the book contained many good marketing ideas. He said it totally articulated the feelings, the coming feelings of the consumer out there that eventually people are going to get sick of all this stuff, all this marketing, and say enough is enough. So the traditional response to the discovery that alternative people, whatever that means, were getting into the brand, which would be, say, taking out, 30, taking out ads on alternative radio stations, was nixed. And so was any other regular form of advertising. And instead, so what does that leave? What that leaves is things like cash payments to uh, rowdy bike messengers who want to screw around in the park, but who don't want to deal with banners or company reps getting in the way. And it's striking how many of PBR's many relationships like this were actually initiated by the representative of some subculture approaching past. Stewart didn't court the bike messengers of Portland. One of them approached him with the idea. Later, he heard from other messenger groups in New York and elsewhere. Other sponsorship requests were relayed to him through contacts at undergroundish magazines like Vice and Arthur. Each little sponsorship effort, skateboard movie screenings, art galleries, independent publishers, expanded the network. Now, a year or so after Stewart took his trip to Portland, I took one. I was met there by Scott Proctor, who a few months earlier had joined Pabst as its Oregon sales manager. A beer business veteran, he referred to bars as accounts. He remembered Pabst having a minute base in Portland. In 99, the company had just 41 accounts in the city. Five years later, the number was more than 10 times that. Proctor was 48, affable, and openly baffled by the weird PBR base. I've been in some different accounts than I would normally see if I was going to have a beverage myself, he remarked. I had to open up my mind a little bit. <laughs> now, just before my visit, the Portland alternative paper Willamette Week, which you probably are familiar with, had run a big picture of a guy drinking a PBR at the Lutz Tavern with a blurb that mocked middle-class, college-educated, salaried Portland hipsters for drinking PBR. It's totally not indie rock, so there, the magazine said. So I was curious if there was a backlash underway. So we visited the Lutz Tavern. It was a homey place with a pool table and an apple green linoleum bar top. As Planet Claire played on the jukebox, the bartender and a few post-college age patrons, all of them young women, all of them drinking cans of PBR, mulled the state of the brand for my benefit. They promptly brought up the no advertising factor. And while the subject of posers treating the beer as a fashion accessory came up, it didn't really seem like that much of a problem. And in fact, they encouraged us to eat down the block at a place that sold southern style food and for $3, 40 ounce PBRs in a small bucket of ice. When we drove through the Hawthorne neighborhood, every bar seemed to have a PBR sign. In the Fred Meyer grocery store there, there was more shelf space in the cooler for PBR than for Budweiser. It was like a parallel universe. And later, without Proctor, I went to Alberta Park to check out the bike polo shenanigans. Uh, Ryan Kelly, a comparatively mild-mannered mild man mild messenger who actually arranged for the first PBR sponsorship, allowed that the beer's newfound popularity was slightly annoying, but basically he said, we're going to drink whatever beer costs a dollar. Another writer, Tad Bamford, sweaty with big hoop earrings and an open cut on his elbow, looked at me as if I were a fool when I asked him whether PBR's trendiness might cause him to abandon the drink. Yeah, I know all about that, he paused, and I couldn't care less. He seemed to be finished with me at that point, so I moved on. And eventually, I ended up at the dank and scruffy Ash Street Saloon, where I met a 28-year-old named Phil Barnes, who had recently gone through four tattoo sessions to get a Pabst logo about a foot square burned into his back, which he showed me. Paps is part of my subculture, he said emphatically. It's the only beer I think about. He was a skateboarder, worked as a cook, and described his peer group as, quote, scumbag punk rockers. Barnes was a little cagey about talking to me at first because his friends had, warned, had, had worried that somehow a picture of his tattoo would be used to promote Paps and he wouldn't be compensated. Eventually, however, he did talk to me and he noted that he had never seen a Pabst ad of any sort, which he liked, because it showed that, quote, they're not insulting you, unquote. Barnes had also seen that Willamette Week item making fun of PBR drinkers, and he'd given it some thought. And he concluded that he didn't care. The only thing that's going to stop me from drinking Pabst is when I die, he said, lighting a cigarette. <laughs> So I use that example because this word marketing 
refers to two, both sides of the dialogue and what's changed. Because when I look at what's changed, one thing is uh, these kinds of tactics, like instead of here's an ad, here's the pitch, here's the product, here's why it's good, here's who should have it, what we have is a lot more tactics along the lines of let's just sponsor some people who we think are interesting and we good evangelists for the brand doing something. It's a very sort of, it's like is that advertising? There's no sign. There's sort of, clearly they got some goodwill benefits from it as the word spread among that subculture and then eventually to people who emulated that subculture. Clearly PBR's decision making process was partly uh, driven by the fact that they really didn't have that much money to work with. But very similar murky tactics involving event marketing, involving um, all kinds of internet marketing, all kinds of um, word of mouth marketing uh, are used by now massive brands. Red Bull, uh, Axe is one that's in the book. Um, and the net effect that people don't talk about as much when they talk about the effect of new technology on this uh, dialogue they talk about how it empowers consumers and they ignore how much, in my view, it empowered marketers. And what I mean by that is it broke marketers out of the box of, well, we can only be in this place. And it forced them to say, we have to be somewhere else. Where can we be? And the answer turned out to be everywhere, as we're learning, uh, I think, every day. But the marketing idea also encompasses the other side of that equation, which is why I use the PBR story as my little example, because the core idea for this new meaning of PBR was not cooked up at Pabst Brewing headquarters. It was cooked up by consumers. PBR certainly reacted to it and came up with their own uh, ways to amplify it, which another brand I talk about in the book is Timberland, which also had its brand meaning redefined by consumers in ways that it did not understand and at first resisted, and resisted for some years before finally essentially capitulating to what, you know, the marketplace had decided its product was about. Um, so that's what marketing refers to, that whole change. And that's what I think has happened, is that because of all the things I've talked about, the possibilities of brand meaning have gotten deeper into our, into our lives and into both in ways that we kind of want to resist and in ways that we, whether we know it or not, um, embrace. And I wrote the book to try to pull back the curtain on that process, on both sides of that process, both the, the professional side of it, what the industry, how the industry works, and also the sort of psychological side of it, how our own mind works. But I'm not just doing this to complain <laughs> um, or to um, be a drag. Um, I'm doing it because I think that as much as people will sort of protest and say, oh, brands aren't that big a deal, you're over saying the whole thing, it's just, it's, just, it's just stuff. It's not that important. We all know that actually our consumer behavior is quite important. Um, and we're reminded of it a lot lately because of all the attention that uh, goes to the um, various environmental issues. Our, our decisions have real consequences in the world. They also have real consequences in our lives. Um, they have consequences in terms of what you buy that seems like it will be satisfying at first, maybe a Viking range, and that six months, a year later, like, why did I buy that? And meanwhile, you're trying to, to, instead of really asking yourself that question, you're buying something else. This brings me around to this idea of consumer ethics that I mentioned as the half factor earlier. I only give it a half factor because as much as we all, and survey after survey shows that people will say, yes, I care about, um, I do want to buy environmentally sound products, I do want to buy sweatshop free products, I do want to buy what I term broadly ethical products. Um, the, the uh, data also shows, however, we don't. We really don't do it. Um, you know, 80% of people will say that they want that. Maybe 10 to 12% of marketplace activity is really guided by that. Why is that? I think some of it is, you know, people will say anything to pollsters that they think pollsters want to hear. And I think some of it is the marketplace isn't set up that way. Uh, there's a famous sort of que que uh, question that they'll ask about, uh, would you pay four dollars more for a t-shirt that wasn't made, that you know wasn't made in a sweatshop? And people overwhelmingly say yes. Well, step into your local department store and try to find the bin where it says, here's the sixteen dollar t-shirt that's possibly from a sweatshop, and here's the twenty dollar one that's definitely not. Marketplace doesn't work that way. Marketplace works exactly the opposite way, which is that every marketer out there is trying very specifically to give you a shortcut so that you're not stopping to reflect and think about that stuff. You're just saying, yeah, nice t-shirt. 
uh, pleasure from this t-shirt or good price on that t-shirt or whatever. And brand meaning is another way to sort of have a shortcut there. So what I'm trying to give um, readers with the book is uh, some information about how to uh, think about this so that they'll be able to make the decisions they really want to make. In terms of what I have to say to business, in a lot of ways, um, it's that we're in a, a really interesting time with this stuff right now because clearly businesses in general recognize that there's a kind of consumer hunger out there for this ethical stuff, this, whether it's the ecology, whether it's you know, the planet. People are uneasy and they're nervous about um, how, their, how their consumer patterns uh, are affecting the world. And a lot of companies are reacting to it with image changes, with um, here's a, a, let's change the packaging to really highlight this one good aspect of our product. It's whatever it is. It could be it's organic. It's low fat. It's um, you know just anything that sounds kind of good. A portion of if the word the last refuge is always a portion of proceeds go to something that is worthwhile. Um, and not a lot of thought is going into changing business practices to look at what are the worst practices that we're doing and how can those be changed. I talk in the book about American Apparel as a company that I know a lot of people don't like because it has kind of this raunchy public image. But one of the things that I think is overlooked in the story of American Apparel is while, that while it did transition away from its original sweatshop free image and into this new sort of sex image, it didn't change its practices. And in fact, the workers there make more money and have more benefits than they did back in the days when they were pushing the sweatshop free image. And I think there's a good lesson in that about the importance. And, and the cons there are consumers of American Apparel who are attracted to the uh, uh, better known stuff, but there are other consumers who know perfectly well what's going on with the um, uh, ethical practices of the company. And I think it was a good, it's a good lesson from that company, the importance of business practice over uh, sort of trying to tout the halo effect of whatever, whatever it is that, uh, you know, uh, it, it's not about imagery, it's about reality. The last thing I'll say is that there's a, the book kind of rounds out on a discussion of the crafting and DIY sort of handmade movement, which I think is a really interesting sort of subset of um, consumer culture right now that has a tremendous amount of interesting potential and I think is really responding to this desire that people have to get past the image thing. It's, it's image driven in some ways. All these young people brand themselves, but there's thousands and thousands of them selling on Etsy.com and so on. And they're really um, bringing something new to the dialogue about material culture and they're not doing it quite in the form of resisting it because it's about material culture. Um, they're selling stuff. But they're trying to, on some level, uh, refocus the dialogue and move it in the direction that uh, consumers might want it to move in um, and rather than reacting to the dialogue that someone else has started. So, that's what I have to say, and I'm very happy to answer as many questions as you would like. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, sir. When, in your mind, did, did, did brand achieve its, 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 its place in, 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 in the mass consciousness? I'm sure you can look back over the 20th century and see things, particularly the premium brands that, you know, yeah. Cadillacs and so forth, there were Cartiers, there were people and stuff, but this sort of premium stuff. But it seems like there was a, a point where I mentioned this to you before you started talking, maybe in the 1980s, you thought maybe earlier, where there was a big inflection point. People started, the brands became almost like celebrities. They were they were something that were, were commonly discussed and acknowledged. People became self-aware of the people, you know, it started to be, like young people started having reactions to brands. Mm -hmm. Of course, before the relationship was much simpler. Like I say, rock bands that, 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 that had any tint of commercial uh, association or sellouts. And now it's, it's so massively inverted. What, what, what do you think is, where, where for you are the inflection points and, and what's driven that? Well, I think that there probably have been a series of inflection points. And I think it's probably been a gradual process. And the, the, the inflection point, I guess, that I'm dealing with in this book of the sort of 21st century era is um, like each one builds on, on, on what happened before. So by the time we got to this 
new world that we're in now, a lot of the stuff that you're talking about had definitely happened. Um, and I, there's probably a generational factor to some extent in that every generation grows up more thoroughly soaked in the idea that brands are important or that, the, that brands are legitimate um, than the prior generation. And I don't actually necessarily reject the idea. I'm, I'm not saying brands don't, don't matter at all, uh, really. I'm saying that it's uh, just useless. I'm saying, in fact, that it's useless to take that point of view because clearly brands do matter in the culture. And it's important to kind of almost embrace that so you can figure out uh, brand to brand, well, what does this thing really stand for? Does it really stand for something that I believe in? Or does it just stand for something that I kind of vaguely want to be associated with? You know? And so one of the most surprising things to me about, um, I definitely agree that sort of it, like in the music realm, it's, completely, it's harder and harder to find anyone who will criticize an indie band for doing a deal with Converse or whoever. Um, however, one of the things that surprised me about this book is I did obviously go looking to spend time with sort of younger, skeptical, savvy people on the kind of cutting edge. And what I found that there was a really interesting subculture of such people who what they were doing was instead of creating, they were just the kind of people who would start a band. But instead what they were doing was in fact starting their own uh, brands. Um, I talk about an example, a couple of examples in the book are the hundreds and um, Barking Irons. Both happen to be t-shirt brands, which I picked because t-shirt is such a sort of empty commodity. Like it doesn't, a t-shirt doesn't really, it's very hard to distinguish between if you put out five black t-shirts, they kind of all look the same. If you put a Ramones logo on one and a Nike logo on another one, they're two totally different objects. And you probably will have a reaction to which one you would be willing to wear, or if you prefer the blank one. And these kids had figured that out, and they were figuring out, well, if brands are something that really can have that kind of meaning and can really express an idea, if the Ramones logo expresses an idea, let's do that, but let's not bother to be the Ramones. Let's just go with the logo side of it. Let's just go with the creating a brand power, and let's play with that. Which is, that's the inflection point that I'm dealing with in this book, which I think is a new era beyond um, you know, the 80s. Does that make sense? I want to, yes, but I want to ask a follow up. Okay. You said, do you really believe that you said, you said it doesn't matter, you know, the, 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 you know, what, you know, do you really believe that, that it really does matter that, that, that we as individuals need to be concerned with differentiating amongst brands? Or is, it, do, is that just sort of conceding the, the, to the marketers that the brands matter? And that's a really, in a sense, it's a false dialogue at a certain level. I mean, we could go back to your four pillars of, of, of purchasing and say, well, yeah, if it meets these other needs, I can do that, and I don't have to share my, occupy my, my intellectual or psychic space with the, the entire of the brands yeah. asserting their importance and relevance yeah. in, in our, our, our social life. I'm not saying you have to accept on face value what a brand is projecting, but I think that it's pretty important to recognize that brands have power in the culture and that coming into the marketplace with an attitude of like, none of that stuff matters, I'm above it all, and it doesn't affect me, is pretty much the worst possible mindset you could be in. Because whether you're consciously, I don't suggest that anyone consciously thinks like, gets up in the morning and says, um, you know, I want to be an individual. So I'm going to go buy, uh, you know, um, a, an iPod because that's a really individual, Apple's a really individualistic brand. No one does that. Um, and I wouldn't suggest that. It's something that's happening on a non-conscious level. And it's absolutely happening. And you can sort of say, like, nah, it doesn't affect me. I do everything uh, based on these rational factors. I think that's a bad, a I think that's the wrong attitude to have because it is affecting you. And if you don't think about it, it's more likely to have more effect on you um, as a result. That's just my, that's my view. I'm going to ask you a question. Uh, do you have a, uh, like a personal turning point in your relationship with brands and identity? Mm -hmm. It's funny you should ask. Um, yeah, I've mentioned Converse just in passing then. There was a period where I was definitely falling exactly into the category of the person I was just describing. Of I was totally above it all. and to I mean, I'm a journalist, so I have to have distance between myself and the subject matter. Um, I was writing about branding. I was writing about marketing. But I definitely saw it as like you know studying the ants and what they were up to. And it had nothing to do with me. Um, and then there was a moment that was actually sort of critical to the decision and certainly to the reporting, uh, the decision to write and, and everything I did in writing the book, when Nike bought um, 
uh, Converse. Um, I'm an admirer of Nike as a journalist, as a business journalist. I think it's one of the most amazing capitalist success stories ever. Um, as a consumer, uh, no offense to anyone who's wearing Nike things, I would not wear the swoosh if you paid me to. <laughs> it's just a little bit sort of, it's just too much of a kind of mark of it's oppressive, it's everywhere, enough already, I'm sick of that thing, I don't want to be involved. So. I had always worn Converse sneakers, though, from uh, about the age of 15. And again, I had never had a moment where I, there was never any time during that period when I woke up and thought, I'm wearing Converse sneakers so I can identify with my rebel heroes, such as the Ramones or whatever. Like, that never happened. But somehow I realized that I was having this crisis about whether or not I could wear, I could continue to wear Converse sneakers if it was owned by Nike. And this, in turn, made me realize that if brands were so meaningless and I was above it all, why was I having an existential crisis about the meaning of a brand? And it had a big effect on um, everything that I, that I did after that because I decided there must be something to this stuff. Um, now, having said that, I want to just mention that uh, the person who asked me this question now is actually a confederate. That question was planted, so don't trust anybody. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, in the back. Um, okay, well, <clears throat> uh, I have to disclose that I work in advertising, so um, I'll qualify that. In, in a, our practice, we, we, we feel that the best advertising is word of mouth, which is really kind of no advertising at all. And I think in your Portland story with the PBR and how that spread to other cities, perhaps one of the un, unstated factors in that was the internet. The mm -hmm. Communication of, you know, um, among mm -hmm. like messengers from one city to another. And um, I'm curious as to what thoughts you've given to the emergence of digital television in terms of consumer power in that dimension. Did, what about digital television? Well, would, what, what would be the aspect of digital television uh, that would... The ability for, uh, for people to have more uh, selective power with uh, you know, how they inter interact with content mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and, and then begin to drive... Uh -huh. and, and what's your tie into that in word of mouth, just so I, I answer this the right way? Um, well, Are those two different points? I mean, digital television has the potential to be, to be internet like. Uh -huh. So, you know, maybe that's a secondary factor. But, you know, the, my, I, I guess my question for you is, is, is digital television going to increase uh, consumers' power to uh, drive these kind of brand movements or... Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know. To me, a lot of that stuff, there's a big, I think that there's a big problem in evaluating this stuff that people get really caught up in the meat, in media issues. And it's, I am much more of a culture focused person. Um, word of mouth existed long before the internet and word of mouth was powerful long before the internet. And really, if you look at what changed in recent years, it isn't that, it isn't that consumers talked amongst themselves and shared information and trusted each other more than they trusted advertising. Um, I think that that's always been true. I think that what's changed in recent years is the degree to which marketers have figured out that, have figured that out and figured out how to harness it and tap into it for their own benefit. That PBR story is an example of that where while it was partly organic word of mouth, it was also sort of juiced word of mouth in the sense that it was, what the word of mouth that was being spread wasn't, hey, PBR is an awesome beer. It was, hey, PBR is giving us $1,000 which is kind of a different thing. Um, and it's basically the insight has been that if consumers trust their friends, let's turn their friends into media. Um, and that, I think, is a much bigger thing. And I think that that has played out on the internet. I think it's played out in real life. And I assume it will. I don't know that much about what will happen with digital, but I assume that. Um, and you know, what is consumer power? And, and like, uh, what part, partly what I'm trying to argue in this book is that I'm not impressed by the argument that consumer power is that we can email our friends and tell them what to buy, um, or that we can complain on a blog and get a free product. 
or whatever. I don't really think that's real consumer power. Consumer power is like, well, what is it that you want companies to do? Do you want companies to behave in a more responsible way? If you look at consumer movements of the past that resulted in things like product, like labeling, you know, or seat belts in cars, those are big manifestations of consumer power. Um, the ability to keep clicking 300,000 times a day and every single thing you look at is sponsored by another company, I'm skeptical of that as, as power in a consumer way. I don't, I don't mean to say, does that, but that's probably the best I can do on the answer to that. Yes, sir. I just want to return to your examples of um, Timberland and PBR, uh -huh. which I think are both interesting because they reflect um, reactionary spin control to unexpected consumer behavior in totally different ways, but with that common thread. And what mm -hmm. I'm looking for your insight on is what happens with the next level of reactionary marketing. Like now, for example, where I see Colt 45 lining mm -hmm. up like PBR, but they're sort of late to the party. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that next stage marketing that happens when there's an unexpected reaction and insight and how both consumers and marketers react to that. And my, my second thing for you is just when you mentioned the crafting movement, mm -hmm. and that's really interesting to me because it's relatively emergent quality. Mm -hmm. And I see like Make Magazine and Etsy and this whole, mm -hmm. you know, emergent plateau that's happening. Have you seen any ergonomic marketing efforts that have gotten in there early and really targeted that and understood it and reflected it? Well, I'm going to combine the two things because in some ways I mean I think that um, I've been asked about this a lot about and I know that companies are looking at that movement and trying to figure out what to make of it and trying to figure out to be blunt they're trying to figure out how to cash in on it you know and to some extent there has been some limited movement to essentially sponsor uh, to do what sort of something like what PBR did with uh, and, and to do Scion and Red Bull have both been involved as sponsors of crafting events. Yeah, I don't know if Mountain Dew has or not. I'd have to take your word for it on that. Um, and so they're trying to sort of align themselves with the culture. And this is kind of a paradigm that a lot of brand, big brands are using is that we'll support, we'll support your efforts. Um, and what the brand gets out of it is kind of a, like a positive association with this, you know, it's like, well, but you know, I've talked to a lot of crafters about it, and the feelings are very mixed. There are some people who feel like a, an automobile company has absolutely no business uh, being in that subculture in any way. Um, some people feel that if the automobile company's checks clear, fine. <laughs> uh, so it kind of varies. Um, so, and I wanted to mention that with that Colt 45 thing, they're actually owned by the Pabst Brewing Company, Colt 45 is. So they're essentially trying to just recreate some version of that. But so far as I know, there isn't any organic, I don't, I don't, I, I'm not aware of there being any organic new interest in Colt 45. I think that they're attempting to create some new interest around Colt 45. Um, and I'm not sure if that's any Colt 45 drinkers here. <laughs> You are? <laughs> All right, good for you. Um, <laughs> uh, other, let me get you. Yes. Uh, your quote from 1939, which obviously you hoped we would be in, interpreted as something written this past year, uh, made me think that is it, isn't it just a continuous history of a kind of arms race between marketers and consumers? Yes. Where marketers obviously want to manipulate. Uh, consumer behavior and consumers historically have resented being manipulated. So Absolutely. the marketers figure out some new way to manipulate consumer behavior and it takes a while for consumers to catch on to it and then they, there's a backlash against it and the marketers have to come up with something else. So this, this idea of uh, sponsoring events without any overt advertising is kind of the latest thing. But another, another uh, kind of newish or at least greatly expanded trend that I've noticed recently that I think is a kind of attempt to manipulate without consumers being aware of it is the, the explosion in uh, product placement yeah. in TV and movies. And uh, my favorite example of this is Apple, where from about 2000 to 2005, television literally was the al alternate universe 
yeah. in the sure. John Lewis reality distortion field yeah. where yeah. Macintosh had 95% market share yeah. and Windows had 5%. Yeah. And I, I get the sense in the last couple of years that, that the pendulum has started to swing back. I see a lot more Dells. Well, TV shows. here's what I don't know, and maybe you do. Uh, I don't know how much of that was actually paid product placement. Um, my hunch is, if you want to hear something that Microsoft employees don't really want to hear, is that a lot of those characters on those TV shows were um, being portrayed as cool and admirable in some ways. And cool and admirable people are surrounded by the appropriate symbols that express that, and that would be the Apple computer as opposed to Adele. Maybe, but I, mean, I think that, that I would not be surprised if that decision was made much more by. Uh, it's it's very murky again. Like, but there are situations where things are paid for, and it's clear that it's doesn't really like it. Like that doesn't make any sense. Why would that person be doing that? Um, and there are other situations where cre Hollywood creators are aware as anybody else that you know it, that this character would use this kind of would whatever drink this it kind was, of beer. It use was everybody. Drink. It was. You know, police detectives were using Apple. Yeah, that's kind of weird. <laughs> no, it's true, though, and there's been much more product placement, and it's much more. And there are a whole, I talk in the book about Axe, the deodorant uh, brand, which actually had a whole show that, uh, called Game Killers that uh, started as, a fr came right out of the creative brief for Axe, that um, a game killer was something that was a, the type of person that was relevant to one of their ad ideas. And they said, this is such a cool idea. Let's just take it to MTV and make it a whole show. And MTV said, great. So when you TiVo past that, um, you TiVo past the entire show. Do you think there'll be a backlash against product placement? It's gotten so blatant. I don't know. People always, uh, like, uh, people always complain about it. And it continues to work. And no one, I, I, I saw, actually someone emailed me today, something today about FTC having, I mean, if it's going to happen, it's, I don't think it's going to come, like, People aren't going to march in the streets about it. But it's possible that at some point, and I know that in Britain there are much more strict uh, laws and thoughts, at least, per pursuit of the, the, these, these issues. Um, but I don't, I don't know. I, I, people have been predicting a backlash against this stuff for a long time. Right yeah. 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 They're, they're proposing uh, regulations on, on product placement. The FCC, OK. Yes, yes sir. I will point out that. Uh, and in, the, in the graphic industry, there's an awful lot of Macintosh that may, may explain that stuff without any any product label or payment. It could be, yeah, it could be, it could be. I just don't. In the case of the, just for the, I don't, I don't know the specifics of the Apple thing. Um, well, I have to defer. Let you get to go. <laughs> I have questions, but one. Three. Is, um, how do you feel about the John Hodgman created Apple Mac commercial? Um. Well, in terms of are they entertaining or are they yeah, effective? Yeah, kind of your thoughts about them. Um, I, as a, personally, as a consumer, I, I'm tired of seeing them. There's too many. Um, I, as a business journalist, I understand why they keep running them because it's clear that they, that they work. People talk about them all the time, you know, and they've become part of, part of popular culture. I mean, he's, Hodgman is almost more, he's more famous th for that than his outstanding writing and his hilarious. Uh, Actually, yeah. I was thinking about inviting to Hodgman to Microsoft. What do you think? Yes. 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 So, um, yeah, I already have an invite. Good, I'm get lynched for that. Um, the next question I have is, what about authenticity? I mean, you walk into Whole Foods, and you know they don't sell bleach because it's poison, but they have they fly in, you know, strawberries from Brazil. Do you know what I mean? And sometimes it seems to me that their message. Um, doesn't jive with the reality of what mm -hmm. people know they're doing, really. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered about at what point do people, you know, does it tip and people will shop there? I don't you know. When yeah. Um, in discussing authentic, authenticity is a word that gets terribly abused, unfortunately, because um, what does it really mean? I mean, people don't tend to define it. I, and when I talk about it in the in the book, I mean, and everyone wants to have an authentic, like, I mean, uh, it's obvious you don't want to have, like, a phony brand. Um, although I actually sort of think it would be interesting for someone to, to do that. I was this, uh, talking to somebody about this Seattle's Best uh, coffee, which I guess is just a division of Starbucks or something. And I feel like they should actually just go with that and, and make that the centerpiece of their branding. Um, it would be something different. But I'm sure it'll be all about their heritage and all that kind of stuff. So I mean, the thing is, um, uh, in the book I talk about, so what is authentic? And in the book I talk about uh, Echo, the Echo Rhino 
um, which is associate, like sort of came out of hip hop and is now, you see all kinds of people wearing the Echo Rhino now, it's really sort of crossed over and become an acceptable brand for all kinds of people. But it's, it's authentic quote unquote roots or sort of in hip hop culture. Well, what does that mean? Like what's the sort of empirical reality behind that? And you know, the guy who created that brand is, you know, he's a suburban New Jersey uh, white kid who, you know, learned about graffiti from a coffee table book. Um, is his brand authentic or not? I mean, you could make one argument saying, um, well, it's not authentic because he's not really, doesn't have any real roots and he didn't come from the streets and all that. Um, I would ar argue that our authenticity is decided on in this dialogue. And if it, I mean, authenticity happens in the marketplace. And if the marketplace judges it to be authentic, then it is. So to go circle that around to Whole Foods, I think that Whole Foods actually makes more effort than most companies to have a point of view. Um, to say that I know that they have rules about we won't that there are things we, and there are things that they could sell that they won't sell because it doesn't meet their standards. Um, when you get down to the level of you know uh, things being flown in and um, I don't know they're not saying it's not called local foods <laughs> it's called Whole Foods so uh, it's it's hard to say and and to some extent. I tend to want to push back on the consumer and say, look, if that's an issue that's important, you know, or like if these are the issues that are important to you, you can resolve some of those issues by shopping at Whole Foods, but maybe there are others that you're going to have to take on the responsibility yourself in some other way. Not you personally, but. <laughs> Market or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Well, my final one is there's a bunch of work coming out lately and a lot coming out this fall on using MRIs to study yeah. the way advertising works. Yeah. And it doesn't seem like, you know, it seems like you're talking more, you know, not a, not a measurable right. brain snip. Well, most of what's come out so far is essentially research that doesn't do much, in my view, it doesn't do much more than um, confirm uh, psychology that's been kind of documented in other ways. But now it's confirmed with brain scans. Um, it makes the media very excited because they can write these stories about a buy button in the brain and all this kind of stuff. We're a long way from knowing what it means that neurons are firing. All we know when we see, in my opinion, from what I've been able to read, basically what we know when we see a picture of neurons firing in a part of the brain associated with individuality is we know that neurons fired in a part of the brain that are associated with individuality. We don't really know what that means or how to make it happen and all that kind of stuff. And people are really interested in it, though, um, uh, and spend, spending a lot of money to figure out everything they can, but I think we're a ways away from having any real breakthroughs on that that I'm, I'm aware of. Someone here might know more about it than I do. Um, yes, you have your... Is it, <laughs> Is it important for companies to create or have communities around their brands? Um, I mean, it's certainly a good uh, thing to have happen. Um, and that's another one that's tough. It sort of seems surprising that people would want to form communities around brands. It seems like a weird thing to do. If we all hate marketing so much, why would there be a, an iPod community or whatever? Um, you know, I, it's clearly something that every company wants to have happen. And I'm not aware of any company discouraging it from happening. But often the efforts to try to force it to happen um, are a little suspect. Um, and probably counterproductive in that they, all they do is underscore the complete lack of enthusiasm about the, um, about the brand. There was a thing where, um, I think it was Vespa was trying to do, they had this, there's this really famous uh, guy who's like an expert on blogging or whatever and, he, and business blogging and he had created some, he had sort of overseen the creation, like hiring these Vespa bloggers and it just sort of went nowhere, and those sites actually expired. It was just really embarrassing because it just made, it made Vespa look sort of, in my opinion, sort of clownish because they had sort of tried to do this thing and it just didn't happen. And part of it, I think, was they made a mistake as an outsider. I'm not a scooter guy, but I think that there were already all these existing community sites around scooters, not any specific brand, just scooters and like the community of people who did that. And Vespa was trying to peel off part of it and say, no, just, just talk about our scooters. <laughs> and it just clanked, you know. So um, people are certainly trying all kinds of stuff like that, though. Um, all right, let's see. Let's go over here. Um, I was a little bit unclear on what you meant by talking about American apparel as an example 
of the potential for consumer power. Um, because it seemed to me as though the story might be that there's a small minority of people who do care about the so-called ethical mm -hmm. practices, and they have shopped at American Apparel since the beginning. Mm -hmm. But when the image switched to a more sex-based rather than ethics-based one, that brought in the uh, the majority. That that brought in the rest of the people who are much more. Well, I may have confused that in saying I I I, I don't. I didn't mean to suggest American Apparel as an example. I'm, I'm trying, was trying to transition there. American Apparel is one of the, there's, I'm trying to speak to consumers about how they can exercise what, you know, their choices in ways that affect what's really important to them. And to the extent that to which I have something to say to businesses, I point to American Apparel as an interesting business to look at. I'm not talking to consumers there. And what I think is interesting to me, to business about American Apparel is that while everyone focuses on the marketing, um, there's something compelling about the fact that their business practices are so different from everyone else in their industry. Does that make more sense? I see, yeah. Okay. But it I, I must have run those together. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yes. I've made a transition in my career from a cultural scholar to now a marketer, and so I'm sort of listening to Pays better, right? it here. <laughs> <laughs> two sides of the same coin in some ways, but uh -huh. in different ways very different, right? So I'm listening to what you say kind of from two different perspectives. And one is, uh -huh, you know, this makes sense, and, and it's right to think about this in terms of culture and not just in, in mm -hmm. term, a lot of the business terms that we're used to thinking about. It. And in the other sense, although you know it's clearly not your job at a ten as a as a reporter to, to do this, but I'm trying to think about you know okay, what's my takeaway that's going to make me a better marketer? You know, mm -hmm. From the purely like, I'm on this path to hell. I'm here to sell things to people. How do I how do I leverage what you're trying to say to help me be a better marketer? You're absolutely right. That's not my agenda. I know it's I know it's not. But I'm going to from you, if you if there's it's any your job. You it's your job to, to take away from this whatever you want to take out of it. Right. You know what I mean? Your shoes, but what, what message would you give to somebody who's who's trying trying to pull something out that says, what can what can I take from this that helps me take these insights and not necessarily just extend my product and sell more, but understand the nature of what I'm doing better, mm -hmm. um, so that so that I can do it better as a craft. In a lot of ways, I'm a bad person to ask that. A lot of my readers are in the marketing business. A lot of them. Um, I don't know exactly what they're getting out of it. I assume that what they get out of it is that I'm a knowledgeable observer who's not in the business. And I assume that what they get out of it on some level is very specifically that I'm not going to come up with, all right, here's the five-point plan. It works every time. Because there's a lot of guys out there with a five-point plan that works every time. And let me tell you a secret, it doesn't work. So you can listen to them if you want, but they're trying to sell you their Kool-Aid. I don't have any Kool-Aid for you. You know, I have my point of view on what I think is happening and what I think matters in the culture. Um, what I said just now about American Apparel is like th the reason that I, I sort of I emphasize over and over that I wish that more I wish that I would get more questions from people saying how can our business be changed in a way that would make it better. You know, um, but I don't. I get a lot of questions about. Um, how can we convince people that there's a community of fans around? Well, I don't know. Uh, is there a community of fans around your product? It's hard to say. And you know, it really goes to what I'm talking about. Like with this, with this moment that we're in, I was saying earlier, with there's a lot of awareness that consumers are kind of concerned about the earth, for lack of a better word. And so much of the reaction has been to flood the marketplace with new symbols of virtue attached to every product. Fiji water is now marketed as every drop is green. It's Fiji water. It comes from Fiji. It's brought halfway around the world. Um, every drop is now green because of reforestation efforts that they've undertaken that have uh, offset their carbon emissions. If you walk away from that thinking that the best thing you can do to save the planet is buy a bottle of Fiji water, I don't know how, mu I don't know how helpful that is to the, to the overall dialogue. You know. Um, the, on this very specific subject of marketing, when I'm asked sort of what makes a good ad, over and over I just say honesty. You know, just be honest. Be honest about being an ad and be honest in what you say. If there were more of that, I think that it would make um, the world a better place.
Sorry. I know that wasn't useful, but that's the best I can do. <laughs> okay, you go ahead. I, I'm just curious about, you know, sort of you are what you eat. What is your media diet? Where do you get your information and how do you translate it into what you do? Um, I get everything from this one blog. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I look at all kinds of stuff. I mean, I look at someone at, like, the uh, I, uh, feed read blog lines reader, 210. It changes all the time, 210 things there. But that's, like, not really a great, like, that's a good way to spot patterns and things like that. Most of my ideas tend to come from a combination of, you know, I read, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and most of the business publications. Um, and I talk to people. And most of the ideas come from talking to people and finding what people are talking about and what they have something interesting to say about. Um, and sometimes that cross-checks with like, oh, yeah, I just saw something on a blog about that. That's weird. That's interesting. Or didn't the journal just say that, that the opposite? Um, uh, and I will say also that I do, uh, 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 I read a lot of things that I, I read a lot of people, I read a lot of not just blogs, but sources that I don't like. Um, and I read them specifically because I don't agree with the way they view commercial culture. Um, but I'm trying to find a different point of view. Um, so there is no easy answer to that. And there is no, and in terms of what I write about in the column, there's a, a, another factor which is basically do I have something to say about this that I think my reader will be interested in? Um, because I have ideas about who my reader is, and that's who I'm working for at the end of the day. So I'm not trying to, there's not like a rigid formula beyond that. It's just kind of my gut about what do I think I, what do I, think I can come up with to say about that? And my reader will say, um, honey, did you know? It's, a honey, it's the honey, did you know moment is what you're getting, is they're sitting at breakfast, and did you know? Um, so that's what we're trying for. All right. Now, is this a real question? It's a real question. Okay. Because <laughs> we didn't rehearse anything beyond that one. Let's see what uh, I can do. So, in terms of conversations uh, that sort of uh, fill out your idea base, how has having and starting your own marketing blog um, fit into that? And what kinds of interactions do you get out of that that you would be less likely to get in just serendipitous interactions? Yeah. Um, that's been a good experiment. It's been going on for a couple of years and um, has paid off a few times. I'll use the site sometimes, the marketing site, to all float out um, just like, um, you know, anybody know anything about this? And sometimes, sometimes I'll get interesting responses and sometimes I won't. Um, and that will both, both things help me because if I don't, if sort of no one reacts, then it's like, eh, maybe I'll just walk away from this one. And then every once in a while, I have some, some people who have just given me this. We were talking about Destination, the local. That was a reader tip from someone who contacted me through marketing and just said, this is a, a company I think you would like and, uh, or that you would be interested in. Um, so yeah, it's paid off a few times, a few times. It doesn't work with everything, but there have been a few times when it's worked out really well. Yes, sir? What's the most positive and most negative uh, reaction you've gotten from some things you've written? Huh. Well, I'm still waiting for positive reactions. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, one of the columns, this, th the truth is that the old advertising stuff I used to do would get, for whatever reason, and this actually influenced me in a lot of ways, that I was, I started writing that advertising column for Slate, and I was shocked at the, at the degree of vehemence that people uh, expressed in their opinions about, um, about uh, whether an ad was, was good or bad and how stupid I was for saying the wrong thing. Uh, that was kind of formative to me in sort of saying, like, maybe I'm onto something with this idea that there's an audience for this stuff uh, who, will take it, um, who will take it seriously. The columns that tend to get the most reaction, uh, pro or con, usually deal with some of these kind of consumer ethics issues that I'm talking about of Fiji Green, like I wrote a column about Fiji Green, um, or fair trade coffee, or stuff like that. Those seem to get the most interest. I don't know, though, if that has more to do, that might have more to do with the consumers who are, the readers who are engaged in those issues are more passionate and therefore more likely to express an opinion. But it, ha it did give me the sense, and just the, over the time of writing the column, that that was the general subject area, that consumer ethics subject area, that I needed to have the book 
close on and, and lead you up to, basically. In the back. Um, do you think it's possible for there to be a brand without necessarily providing a product or a service? And I'm kind of thinking about things like Paris Hilton. <laughs> about what? Oh, Paris Hilton. Paris Hilton, yeah. Um, sure. Um, and Paris, there's a light, Paris Hilton is uh, just the name. Or her, she, has, she has a licensing arrangement, uh, or did, with uh, one of the top licensing firms where they were just... Um, it was just like, here's the, here's the brand, Paris Hilton, and see what you can license this onto. Um, I don't know where that stands. Unfortunately, that coincided with whatever latest round of unpleasant stuff she was involved in. I don't know if that went anywhere. Um, yeah, there are, um, it's kind of come up a few times uh, in the column and in real life of sort of the brand without a product. There's, a, there's, a, um, there's an artist here in, um, Seattle named Sean Wolf, who did a very famous project called uh, um, Beat Kit, which was the brand without a product, and um, posters all over it, and then it created a lot of interest. And in a lot of ways, Shepard Fairey's Obeyed Giant uh, project was for a long time a brand without a product, and then he just went ahead and started making products. <laughs> um, so, and then I've written in the column about um, well, I wrote in the column, the, I know my confederate here, through uh, Brondo, uh, which was a, 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 a fictional drink that existed only in a movie, in Idiocracy, the Mike Judge movie, that someone brought, uh, decided needed to exist in the world. So uh, apparently we're open enough to brands that even, there aren't enough of them around. We have to bring them out of the movies and make them up out of thin air and, <laughs> and uh, embrace those. Give you one more question. All right. Here we go. Uh, Microsoft is a huge company, obviously, and has lots of products. We have Xbox that competes with a bunch of different things. We have Windows that competes, Live Search that competes. Mm -hmm. um, I guess, as, as a brand, do you, what are your thoughts of, of Microsoft itself as a brand? Does, does it matter anymore? Or I guess I'd just like an outside opinion on that. Uh. Well, yeah, as you say, Microsoft is now sort of a collection of different brands, because I don't know that someone associates Xbox with Microsoft quite as much as it probably, s as you might assume. Um, I think Microsoft is a brand, you know, it gets beat up on. Uh, it, ser it sort of serves a whipping boy function. It's sort of a fill-in for a big, scary corporation. But on the other hand, I think it's, it's I, I would assume that it's widely seen as, rely I mean, it's extremely pervasive and seen as a reliable trustworthy thing. That would be my guess. I've never really reported on the, on the reaction to the Microsoft brand. I think that Microsoft has probably been wise to not really extend that brand and to, when they introduced a video game, call it the X, or a, a video console, really branded as the Xbox, and now with the, the Zoom and whatever else you're working on, it's really like the Microsoftness of that is kind of de-emphasized, whereas Apple has very forcefully pushed its Appleness onto everything that it's that it's done. I mean, there's not a different logo for the iPod. It's the it's the it's the Apple logo, and I believe there is a different logo for the Zoom for the uh, Xbox. So I think that's probably the right move. When you're as big as Microsoft, it probably isn't. When you're as big and in the consumer world as Microsoft is, it's probably not hugely helpful to keep pushing yourself into new, and particularly when you have a long history of antitrust battles and so on, it doesn't, it doesn't help. <laughs> so, so that will be, okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. Hope you had fun. I did. <laughs>